Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Twin City Bible Church. My name is Katie Martin, and I will be your guide through various parts of the service today. But let me start with this. I am so glad that you are here with us, and it's Valentine's Day, so I'm even going to say that I love that you are here with us this morning. Thank you so much for being here, for all the greetings and the chats and the funniness going on in the chat box. This is a great way to start off my day. As we are gathering here virtually, we're gathering with one another, but we are also coming together to come into the presence of our loving God. So if you are able, would you stand up with me and join me in today's call to worship? It comes from Psalm 24, and you're gonna see it up here on the screen in just a moment. Would you read with me now? The earth is the Lord's, and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God, their savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates, be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates, lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. Now we're gonna head over to Andy Kim. Amen. Thank you, Katie. Good morning, everyone. It is nice to see you all today. Um, and I'm, I'm here from uh, Southeast Urbana. And we just read a psalm that said the earth is full, is the earth is the Lord and filled with his glory. And I, um, I love how the psalmist remind us that our God is a creator. He created everything in our world, all living creatures. He created us in our bodies. And sometimes, I don't know about you all, but when I spend my week on Zoom looking at a screen, it's easy to forget that and just to think that my life and especially my faith is just some disembodied intellectual experience. Um, and I, and I, I want us to, to think about that, this, that psalm that we just read and this hymn that we're about to sing in a few minutes, that our God created the world and actually the world right in front of us. And so I don't know if some of you all seen this, but I have a really awesome view uh, of a beautiful park. That's Larson Park in Southeast Urbana, uh, formerly known as Wheatfield Park. And I get to see it um, when I take my eyes off my Zoom screen and I remember that our God created the trees, the squirrels that play around. And so um, maybe you have a, a view like that in your home or in your apartment or in your dorm. Maybe you just have a tiny little window that you might see Campus Town or whatever. But what I wanna do is actually, before we sing this hymn, This Is My Father's World, I wanna actually invite us to take a couple minutes and actually to get up and to find a window. And just for a few minutes, just to enjoy creation, to, to not look at a screen for a little bit and to remember that the earth is the Lord's. Um, and so what I wanna do is I wanna give you three minutes um, to find a window. And maybe if you have a lot of people in your home, each pick a window. Um, and if for the kids, like find a window and, and see how many things you could see outside that are the Lord's creation and see what you could find. And when we come back, I'll invite us to share a little bit in the chat. So I'm gonna play for three minutes. Um, go find a window. If you feel really brave, you might uh, even poke your head outside uh, or, or not. Um, and uh, when I start singing this chorus, that'd be a cue to come back. So let's go and enjoy God's creation just for a few minutes. This is my father's world And to my listening ears 
lives. All nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, his hand the wonders rock. Uh, before we go on singing the next two verses, I'd love to hear in the chat, what were some things that you saw from your window? Some beautiful things in God's creation uh, that you saw. Some rabbit tree tracks, firewood. That's awesome. I think I saw Mark saying there's bright snow. Lots of snow. What else did you see? Slumbering trees. <laughs> the Miller's house. Squirrels. Yes. So many things. Cardinals. Palm trees? Oh, yes, palm trees. Jo Thank you, Jonatas. We recognize that it's snow here in central Illinois, but it's beautiful in other places. Yes. Well, you keep that adding that in the chat. And then I would, I would love if, um, if you wouldn't mind taking a picture sometime today. And I'd love in our TCBC family room just to post, what do you see when you look out your window of God's creation today? And so maybe as we continue to sing this song to remind ourselves that this world belongs to God, as crazy and as confusing as it can be, it's also a beautiful place. So let's continue singing verse two. This is my father's world. The birds their carol raise, the morning light, the lily white, declare their maker's praise. This is my father's world, he shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear him pass, he speaks to me everywhere. This is my father's world, I walk a desert alone. In a bush ablaze to my wandering gaze, God makes his glory known. This is my father's world, a wanderer I may roam. Whatever my lot, it matters not. My heart is still at home. This is my father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is king, let the heavens ring. God reigns, let the earth be glad. The Lord is king, let the heavens ring. God reigns, let the earth be glad. The Lord is king, let the heavens ring. God reigns, let the earth be glad. 
This is my Father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied and earth and heaven be one. Would you pray with me? Father, we declare that this world belongs to you. And uh, we gather here on Zoom uh, in this digital way, recognizing though that you created us um, as physical beings, you created the world around us, and you call us to live in this world, um, to love this world with your love, and but also to not be in this world um, and to, to be a witness in this world. And so, Lord, I pray, God, that this morning as we enter into this service and listen for your voice, uh, you might also send us out into this world, this beautiful and this confusing world. Uh, we declare that it belongs to you. Uh, would you have your way in this service and each one of us? In your name we pray, amen. Good morning again, everyone. And thank you, Andy, for leading us through that exercise and also that song. I want to give you some extra love today on Valentine's Day here. <laughs> I see lots of smiles and I'm wondering if anybody else has some Valentine's bling they might want to show off. This is the time to do it. Feel free to turn on your webcams. I see Nancy Rockman has a nice pink sweater on. Um, Andy has a pink shirt on too. So feel free to show off anything festive that you have. But just know that I am so glad you're here today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Katie Martin. I'm coming to you from Urbana today. Let me put my regular glasses back on so I can see you all better. <laughs> um, and this is TCBC. Welcome. Here at TCBC, our mission is to see campus and community transformed by Christ to, the, to renew the world. And I love that mission. I can't think of anything more exciting to be a part of. Maybe you're one of those campus people, you're in the midst of a semester, maybe doing it virtually, maybe on campus, maybe you're a community member ranging from the littlest of the littles. I know I saw Andy Kim's baby this morning, he was so cute, on up to our senior saints. There is a place for you here at TCBC to be a part of our mission, God's mission to renew the world. If you wanna get connected more, the first thing that you can do, whether you are visiting the first time today or whether you have been coming for a long time, we want you to fill out our connection card so we know you're here and we can get to know you a little bit more. There's also a place for there on that card where you can put some questions or comments or ask for us to connect with you in certain ways. So feel free to check that out at tcbc.cc slash online card. Other ways to connect, Andy also, Andy already mentioned that we have our TCBC family room, our Facebook page, and like he said, go there and post some pictures of what you saw at your window today, but you can also post any other needs or thoughts or ideas that you have. This is just a place where we can have some conversations with each other, even though we can't be meeting in person and having those conversations face to face, but there's a lot of fun stuff that goes on there. Another place that you can find more information about us is our website, tcbc.cc. There you can find all kinds of announcements. You can sign up for our newsletter if you want to get information delivered to your inbox every week. I know I find that very helpful. So go there and you can sign up. And finally, another way that we can connect in the in means of prayer is through our prayer wall, tcbc.cc slash prayer. You can get prayed for by leaving a prayer request and you can, you can put your name in there with it. You can leave it anonymous if you want to. And also you can pray for one another. There's a button where you can click and say, I prayed for this. And so if you leave a prayer request, you can see that people are praying for, for you. I know I have found that to be very encouraging and it's just a great way for us to come together to support one another. So check out our prayer wall. 
I also have a few announcements for you this morning about our upcoming services and events. The first one that I want to mention is coming up this Wednesday. It is our Ash Wednesday service. That will be on Zoom at 7 p.m. So please join us for that 7 p.m. on Wednesday. That will be our Ash Wednesday service. Speaking of our services, we are going to have starting next week, some in-person options for you. You will be able to come to TCBC <laughs> and meet in person. If you are interested in that, you will have to register and sign up. You can see the information on the screen and know that the registration window, if you wanna come, will open at noon today. So feel free to sign up. We would love to see you in person next week. Also next week, we will be starting a new sermon series and that is going to be on the Gospel of Mark, and we have a scripture journal for you. I love this picture. If you were with us a couple weeks ago when I emceed, I showed you my, my new pack of colored pens. I know I'm going to be enjoying using my colorful pens in that journal. The pick up dates, you can pick up a journal all throughout this week. You can see the information there. And I know there is a lot of information on this slide and the other slides. It's a lot to remember. So know that you can find all of these announcements if you go to tcbc.cc forward slash bulletin. You can find all of the information there. That wraps up the announcements that I have for you today, but we are gonna head over to Jeff Raisler and he has an announcement for us as well. Thank you, Katie, and uh, good morning, TCBC. I'm Jeff Raisler, Chair of the World Mission Team, and I have some exciting news to share with you all that you've been hearing about often on the past few weeks. We'd like to invite you all, that's everyone here at TCBC, to our On Mission with God, or OMG class. Uh, the information about this class will be uh, showed here on the screen here, um, and it'll tell you some more details as I speak about them. Traditionally, this time of year, as you know, TCBC's mission team puts on a training and mission class where we use our global partners to help encourage, prepare, and equip saints who may be considering short and long-term missions. And this year, after a discussion with Pastor Bryant, he really encouraged the missions team to reimagine uh, what we would do this year and change the, a little bit the acceptance and scope of this class and be a, an extension of this great sermon series in Jonah about God's merciful mission. Uh, as you know, we, we've been learning God, God is on mission to call us fugitives back to him. And uh, since we've received his mercy, we also have been recognizing that he's extending this mercy, not only to us, but to all people, even, even the ones that we may uh, not love like we've seen Jonah uh, with uh, last week's message in Nineveh. And uh, he really calls us to show this mercy and love to others. So our On Mission with God class that's coming up will require your active participation. This is not going to be a um, passive class where you just listen to a speaker. We will challenge you each week with questions. And particularly our overarching question will be, how is God calling you? to be missional in your life in this time and place, both individually and as part of his uh, church, locally and globally. So come join us uh, and explore together on mission with God and come expectantly to grow and be stretched in community uh, every Sunday night. Uh, we'll, use, we'll still use our global mission partners as well as some campus ministers to hear how they've heard God's calling in their life. And, and we want to understand what they're seeing, doing, and learning from their unique uh, place and calling. So that'll be uh, every week we'll have a new speaker, as you see the speakers here on, on, the, on the slide. We'll also spend time during the service or during the study personally wrestling with questions and challenges that we all face being on mission with God uh, every day. So the format of this class, just so you know, uh, we, it will start the class uh, this uh, February 21st. So that'd be a week from today. That'll be at 7.15 on Zoom. You can get to the website on tcbc.cc on mission, and it'll connect you to the Zoom site that will be hosting the class. Uh, we will initially have some breakout times, uh, four to six people where we'll initially connect 
and discuss our weekly challenge questions. We'll then have about a 40 minute conversation with a global partner or campus minister partner. And then as you, as you can see, we've chosen our, our, our speakers to be from different continents, different uh, ministries, different campus ministers, uh, some doing focusing on soul care, some focusing on mobilization. And after they speak, we'll have that bring your journal uh, and you'll have some personal journal time to reflect on what you learned, what God was telling you during the, their talk, as well as then we'll have some corporate prayer time. And then finally, we'll, we'll have a weekly question that we're going to challenge you. So for the first week, when we get there, we're going to we're going to ask you, um, how is what is the Lord calling you to do at this time and place and write down in your journal what you're hearing, seeing, and experiencing uh, this week. So each week we'll have this question. When you arrive the second week, we'll have a breakout time for you to discuss what, what you saw God doing just in that week. Uh, finally, um, the last 15 minutes uh, from 8.30 to 8.45, five uh, we'll be able to have some open question and answers with 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 the speaker uh, to get some updates on what's going on in our speakers lives uh, so it should be exciting uh, we really are looking forward to all who want to come and engage and grow with us and uh, finally want to thank bev hilmer and Luis walter for taking the lead on this new class its organization class objectives uh, putting together our speaker list and Pastor Brian as well for being open and helping us guide, you know, what this class looks like. So check us out on the website, send us an email, sign up, and we hope to see you next Sunday night. And now over to Pastor Steve. Thank you, Jeff. And OMG, that sounds great. I'm sure nobody else thought of that. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm coming to you from Savoy, and it's just really good to be with all of you for worship this morning. Um, this Sunday, uh, February 14th, is not only Valentine's Day, uh, it is also the last Sunday before the season of Lent begins, and it's a Sunday that's traditionally been called Transfiguration Sunday. It's a particular day to mark the event that is recounted in Matthew chapter 17 and Mark 9 and Luke 9, when Jesus is suddenly transformed in front of his disciples from just this simple traveling rabbi in dusty clothes into this dazzlingly bright and glorious figure of power. It's a fitting end to the season of Epiphany that we've been in when our focus has been on beholding the goodness and the glory of Jesus and then also shining that light out into the world. It's also a fitting transition into the season of Lent when we consider what the nature of Jesus' glory really is, the glory of his self-sacrificing love, a glory that we see most clearly and perfectly on the cross. And so those will be sort of the themes that we mixed for this morning together to pray. And so let me invite you to join me right now as we come to the Lord. You are king, O Lord. Let the people tremble. You sit enthroned over all the world. Let the earth shake. You are great, O Lord, exalted over all. And we, your people, praise your great and awesome name. You are holy. And placed a treasure, the knowledge of your glory in the face of Jesus, into fragile vessels, our humanity, so that it would be clear to the world that the power to save the power to set the world to rights does not come from us, but it belongs to you alone. We are humbly grateful, O oh Lord. Thank you, Lord, for making your glory known uh, in the Middle East, in particular, through our global partners, Leanne and Gazim. We praise you for opening a door to them to return to Gazim's home area. And we pray for the partnership that they have been nurturing with uh, the one Protestant church in their region, that they would see healthy relationships grow with the people in that church, and they would see new friendships grow with uh, the many, many non-Christians that are around them in the culture there, so that more people would come to know and to trust your love. We pray for Leanne's uh, work on mastering a new language, and we ask that you would surround and be near to their whole family, especially their kids, as they adjust to this new season of life, new places, new friends, new rhythms of life, 
draw them closer to you day by day. Lord, we pray too that your church in America, including us right here at TCBC, would truly behold and truly reflect your glory. In a time of isolation, Lord, would you draw near to us and remind us that you, Jesus, are Emmanuel. You are God with us, and you have promised never to leave us or forsake us. Help us to be people like that for the world around us, bringing your presence to them. In a time of sickness, would you pour out your healing and your saving power? Would you bless the researchers and the doctors and the nurses and the healthcare workers and leaders whom you have on a mission right now to bring your healing to the world through the very specific ministry of medicine. Lord, would you bless even the, the people in our church family who are at work in that field on that mission right now, keep them safe and use them, Lord, to do great things for your name. And in a time of division and distrust, especially in our nation, we pray that you, Holy Spirit, would be at work in us to make us your ambassadors in this nation, your agents of truth and reconciliation. Would you be at work in your church to purify us, to make us holy as you are holy? God, we ask that today as Pastor Brian opens your word to us and we finish the book of Jonah together, Give us ears to hear what you are saying to us as your people, as your church. Give us hearts to receive that and to respond with faith. Lord, shake us awake this day so that we may see your glory and hear your voice and be transformed more into the image of Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, I'll invite you to turn your video screens off, and I'm going to hand it over to Pastor Brian as he brings us to a conclusion in the book of Jonah. Good morning, Brian. Good morning, Pastor Steve. Good to see everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Pastor Brian, the lead pastor here at Twin City Bible Church. Good morning, uh, TCBC family, and welcome to anyone who is new or joining us for the first time. We are finishing up our sermon series, uh, God's Merciful Mission. Um, excited for our upcoming On Mission with God class next week. Really excited about that. And happy Valentine's Day to everybody. Let me just open in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for our day. Thank you that we could worship you and be reminded you are creator, that you are good. As we turn our attention to your word, Lord, speak to us. Uh, give us grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's sermon is coming from Jonah 4, 5 through 11. I'm going to read our text and we'll talk about it. Jonah chapter 4, 5 through 11. You can grab your Bible or app or read on with us on the screen. Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he could see, till, till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh? that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle. This is God's word. Our teaching point or main point of focus here today from the text that we could extrapolate is the Lord's compassion 
for Champaign-Urbana, for CU in our response, the Lord's compassion for CU in our response. Uh, and I know, of course, we're not talking about Jonah, he says nothing about CU, so we'll get to that. But here are three supporting points to help us along the way. Jonah's false hope, God's sovereign compassion, our invitation. Jonah's false hope, God's sovereign compassion, our invitation. Let's consider Jonah's false hope. What is Jonah's hope? Well, in the text, both this specific text for today and throughout the book of Jonah, there's been this tension between deliverance and destruction. Will God deliver Jonah and the sailors who were on the ship in the midst of the tempest in chapter one, or will he destroy them? Will the storm prevail or will God's deliverance prevail? When Jonah is thrown overboard, will deliverance or destruction prevail? And when Nineveh, who has been an evil, wicked, violent people, whose evil has come up before the Lord, we find out in chapter one, when Jonah goes to preach the message, will deliverance prevail or destruction prevail? And here we see Jonah's hope. What is he hoping for? He's hoping for destruction. He is holding out that God is going to destroy Nineveh. If you were here last week, uh, or if you were familiar with the text, you know that he is already aware God has decided not to destroy, but in fact to deliver Nineveh. Yet he still holds out hope. We read it a moment ago, but we'll just look at it here again. Think about this. How do we know he's holding out hope? So he's already heard that God is, he's already re realizing God is showing deliverance, but it says in verse five, Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat in it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. So there's a hope. There's something he's hoping for. He's hoping for destruction. And we just, you know, read about it, but the Lord appointed a plan and the plant comes up and it creates this shade for him to save him from his discomfort. And Jonah's glad about that. Uh, but then dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm and attacked the plant and it withered and Jonah was faint and he wanted to die. Jonah's false hope or his hope is that his perspective of justice will prevail over God's view of justice. Say it a different way. Jonah's sort of calculus equation for deliverance and destruction he wants that to prevail over God's understanding and calculation for deliverance and destruction. Jonah's hope is that his view of the world rather than God's will prevail. He's sitting there. He literally is sitting and watching to see, is God going to change his mind? Come on, God. He goes out of Nineveh. He's sitting on a, uh, in a booth which he made, and he's in the shade. What is his false hope? His false hope is that God's going to destroy Nineveh, even though God has clearly said he's going to deliver. Actually, he's already delivered them. They have turned their hearts in repentance to, to him. And nevertheless, Jonah is hoping in vain. Now, think about God's posture to Jonah in the midst of that. God sovereignly, he blesses Jonah. He gives him a plant to cover him. I mean, this is Middle Eastern heat, the heat of the day. I mean, I can't imagine, of course, here in Champaign-Urbana right now, none of us can imagine blistering heat. But remember a time when that happened uh, and you're out the, outdoors and there is no shade and the, and the sun's beating down. That's what Jonah is feeling. And God brings this plant along to give him some shade. God addresses Jonah's hot head in the same way that he addressed last week, as we read about in the first part of chapter four, his hot head in terms of his anger. And Jonah's exceedingly glad about this plant. Thank you, God. You see, I knew you would see things my way. Thank you for providing this shade while I wait for you to destroy this city. 
God delivered Jonah from the storm. He had delivered Jonah from being tossed into the sea through the fish. Now he's delivering Jonah from the heat. But what happens next? Nightfall comes, then dawn the next day, and then a worm comes creeping along and munch, munch, munch. There goes that plant. It's withered. And when the sun, the sun comes up the next day, a wind is blowing. No longer is Jonah enjoying shade. He is now faint under the heat of the sun, and he wants to die. Jonah's false hope is a false hope because God's already determined to show Nineveh compassion. And it's also a false hope because Jonah's hope is in something other than God himself. Jonah's hope is really focused on him and his understanding of his people, the Israelites. He would rather see God be favoring Israel than showing compassion to their enemies, the Ninevites. We have to see God's actions here are not isolated to Nineveh, but they're a reflection of his character. And thus they affect us. They affect us in our city, how we view our city, how God views our city. And thus the Lord's compassion foresee you in our response. So let's consider God's sovereign compassion. Our second sub point here, God's sovereign compassion. Our culture makes God for the, the aspect of our culture that has an appetite for, for God, um, it sort of makes God out to be either, you know, a spiritual guide or a spiritual therapist. In other words, you have a problem, you go to God, he solves your problem, he helps you to live the kind of life you're trying to live, or you're not feeling good about yourself, you go to God, he helps you feel better. Now, there's elements of truth in that, but in reality, like Jonah, the emphasis is on ourself. It's a worship of self. David Foster Wallace, who's a postmodernist, he's not a Christian, he says this, he says that we rarely talk about this sort of natural, basic self-centeredness because it is so socially repulsive. But it's pretty much the same for all of us deep down. What is he saying? He's saying we're all selfish. We all, as theologians and throughout church history have said, we all have an inward curve of the soul. We all want to look at ourselves and elevate ourselves or be self-absorbed. He goes on to say, David Foster Wallace, the postmodernist, again, not a Christian, he says, an outstanding reason for choosing some sort of uh, God or spiritual uh, type, uh, you know, thing to worship, a reason for choosing one, be it, and he says, be it Jesus Christ or Allah or Yahweh or the wicked mother goddess or the, the, the four noble tr uh, truths or some, you know, intangible a uh, set of ethical principles is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. Now, what is he saying? Again, he's a postmodernist. Modernist. He's saying that whatever you worship outside of a deity is going to destroy you. Like if you worship beauty in your own beauty, ultimately you're going to be consumed with how you appear and you're going to suffer under this impression that you never measure up. If you are if you worship your intellect or your skill or your abilities, you're always gonna feel like you're not good enough or there's somebody out there who's better who will outshine you. It will destroy you. Now, Jesus, the Lord of glory, the sovereign Lord, he's, it, it, he says that deliverance comes to us a, a different way than the way of the world. The world, the culture says deliverance comes to us as long as we have a God who just kind of helps us along or gives us joy and peace. Jesus says, no, true deliverance comes when you turn from living life with you in the center of your world and instead turn to me in faith and live your life with me in the center. That's true deliverance. Now, why does Christ make this claim? He's making this claim because scripture, and particularly here in Jonah, and our, particularly our text today, says that God is creator, and he is sovereign. God is in the center, and he is in control of all things. Not us, not our judgment, not our view of justice, not anything about us, but God. I love how we were able to 
just sit and look out the window and think about how God is creator because he is. In fact, think about the way that God is framed as creator throughout the book of Jonah and even in our text today. The author goes out of his way to point this out. In chapter one, verse nine, when this, you know, they're on the boat, Jonah and the sailors and this, this storm, this tempest is raging and the waves and the are crashing and they're throwing everything overboard. Jonah, once they identify, he's the reason why this storm has happened. He says that I fear the Lord in verse nine of chapter one. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the seas and the dry land. In other words, God made everything. He's creator. And not only is he creator, he is sovereign. He's Lord. He's in control over everything. Consider all of the ways that the text bears this out. Chapter one, verse four. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. Who caused the storm? God did. Chapter 1, verse 17. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Who brought the fish to save Jonah, to deliver him? God did. Chapter 2, verse 10. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah, yuck, out upon the dry land. Why did, this, why did the fish deliver Jonah on the dry land? God spoke to it. Now, in our text today, in chapter 4, verse 6, now the Lord God appointed, same word as the fish, God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his hand. God's in control of the plants. He's in control of the fish. He's in control of the sea. Verse 7, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. God ordered the worm to eat the plant. Verse 8, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah. God is in control of the wind. God is in control of everything. He is creator. He's sovereign. We're not the center of the world. He is. He's inviting us to see the world the way he does through his son, Jesus. But not only is God in control of creation and not only is he in control of the order of things, he's in control over all people. He's able to deliver or destroy. Chapter one, verse one, Jonah, he tells Jonah, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it for their Evil has come up before me. God is judge over the nations. He sees a people that is not his, no covenant with Nineveh. He sees their evil and he's coming to judge them. He's the sovereign ruler over all people. God's sovereignty brings salvation to the sailors who were pagan worshipers in chapter one. At the beginning of chapter one, they're pagan worshipers. At the end of chapter one, they're making vows to the Lord. God is sovereign over all peoples. He sovereignly saves Jonah. It should have been a really short book, honestly. Jonah goes into the sea. Okay, that's it. But God sovereignly saved Jonah when he's thrown overboard. And Nineveh, despite their evil and wickedness, God gave them a chance to turn and repent. And as they did, as they relent, as they they relented of their evil, God relented of the disaster he would bring upon them. He didn't destroy them, he delivered them. God is gracious to Jonah over and over and over, even in his contempt, even in Jonah's contempt for God's compassion towards the Ninevites, such that he provides this shade temporarily for Jonah while he's sitting with a false hope. God is compassionate towards his creation, his creatures, you and I, and our city, because he created us. So that leads us to our invitation. The third part of our sub points, our invitation, if we're really talking about today, if this text is pushing us to see the Lord's compassion for CU and our response. Let's look at the invitation that's before us. Jonah's ways 
in God's ways, and I would say our ways in God's ways, are greatly contrasted in this book throughout the text. We see Jonah sitting outside the city of Nineveh. I mean, I could just imagine he's, you know, arms crossed, just waiting. Come on, you know, Lord, you know, you know, you, you're going to destroy the city. You know, come on, you remember how wicked these people are. Jonah sees the city. God sees the city. They're looking at the same thing but they're seeing it in two very different ways. Jonah sees a people who deserve destruction, the sovereign Lord who created all, who is gracious and compassionate, sees a repentant people to whom he grants deliverance. The book ends in a question. It's rare for a book of the Bible to end in a question. There's only a couple of instances. And that question in, in, in many ways is an invitation. I'll, I'll, I'll read it for us. Verse 10 and 11. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle. God says, Jonah, listen, you have compassion for a plant. It's the same word, the pity or compassion that is used for Jonah's posture towards the plant and God's posture towards the city. So God's saying, Jonah, you have compassion for the plant, which you did not make grow. You didn't plant that. You didn't make it grow, but you pity it. You, you, you missed that plant. You wanted that plant. And God's saying, shouldn't I have compassion for Nineveh and its a people and its cattle, a people and cattle that I created? The question's an invitation. The invitation is for Jonah, one who has overwhelmingly received mercy, to have compassion for the people that God has compassion for, even if they are Jonah's enemies even if they are. God's saying, can't you see who I am? You've received mo mercy, Jonah. You didn't deserve that. Should you have not, shouldn't you, having received mercy, have compassion towards those on whom I have mercy? God redeemed Jonah from the storm and the sea with the fish. God delivered him from the heat with the plant. God has redeemed him, Jonah, as one of his people. Shouldn't he have compassion on Nineveh as well? <clears throat> Excuse me, we are like Jonah. We too are fallen. We too have this same tendency to want our justice the way we want it, or to want our view of the world to, to win out, or to want sort of our calculus for where deliverance and where de destruction should be meted out the way we want it. Yet there's an invitation for us. Those of us in Christ Jesus, like Jonah, have received God's compassion and mercy. And think about how that mercy is delivered to us. Jesus Christ, the author of life, as the scripture says, he was not delivered from the cross, but he was given over to an infinitely great destruction on your behalf and mine. He experienced the wrath of God for you and for me. He did that so that we could through faith in him receive God's mercy and compassion and be delivered rather than being destroyed. When God looks at Champaign-Urbana, when he looks at the campus, when he looks at our community, when he sees our neighbors, as he does every day, as he does every moment, he sees what we don't even see about ourselves at every neighborhood, every part of town. There's a divine invitation for us to see the way he does. 
the Lord's compassion for CU and our response. He is creator of Champaign-Urbana. He's responsible as he's created all of the world. As we read about in our call to worship in uh, Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and, and everything in it. He's the creator. He is sovereign over Champaign-Urbana and everything in it. Every squirrel that we saw a few minutes ago looking out the window, every tree that's positioned, he's sovereign. He's in control over it all. Every person. When you, you know, see headlines or read the headlines or hear them uh, about our our town, you know, what do you think? What do you hope for? Do you hope for deliverance or destruction? Or maybe do you not really think about that? When you think about your neighbors, your your classmates, your doormates, your roommates, your, uh, your coworkers, people you see in the grocery store, what is your hope for them? Deliverance, destruction, or not really sure? These are good questions for us to ask. In fact, the text is inviting us to ask these questions about ourselves. Do you hope for people as you see them every day or maybe not every day intermittently with our stay at home, but do you hope that they might turn away from living with themselves in the center and live with Jesus Christ in the center of their life to, 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 to receive deliverance instead of destruction? Do you find yourself rather being consumed with what's pressing in your life or, you know, what's going on on the national scale or wh whatever the case may be? There's so many other ways that we could uh, focus our energy and our attention. But the Lord is calling us, even as he asked a question to Jonah, he's asking us a question. How will we respond to his mercy? How will we respond to his compassion? How will we respond to other people? Now, how do we cultivate the right response to the Lord's compassion for Champaign-Urbana? Now, I mean, I want to just point out, at no point in all of the book of Jonah does God respond to Jonah with shame. There's never, ever any ounce of shame. God never says, oh my gosh, you know, Jonah, I can't believe you just get your act together. Look, this is what I want to do. You just need to get on board. He never, there's never a response that way. He's patient with Jonah. He's patient with you and I. Yet often we think about things like evangelism or being missional. There's this sort of pressure and this, you know, shame. Maybe we're not good enough. I can't do it that way. Or that's not my personality. God never uses shame to motivate his people. How do we cultivate compassion? One thing that's interesting about compassion, Jesus' is earthly ministry. Of all that's said about him in his, in his, his uh, you know, empathy or, or rather his emotions on, in his earthly ministry, uh, ministry, the number one thing that is mentioned is his compassion for those around him and his desire, therefore, for his disciples to see the world that way. That extends to you and I. We may have our own view of justice. And what I mean by justice is just the whole concept of as what's playing out in the text, deliverance and destruction. We may have our own view of how that should work out on the campus or the community or, um, you know, maybe maybe it's just as simple as this, you know, as a, as a community of, of, of faith at TCBC, we are campus and community. Maybe it's just but we really need to be about the campus or maybe, or, or maybe your view is no, but we really need to do more for the community. Should not our focus be on whatever, wherever God is moving, no matter whether we are on the campus or whether we are in the community, shouldn't our desire to be to show compassion for whomever God is showing compassion? It is both, it's both the campus and the community. We cultivate compassion by recalling that we are redeemed, that we are not here because we deserve to be, but God in his mercy, he's poured out his goodness on us. Every day, daily remembering, you are who you are if you are in Christ because of God's abundant grace and mercy to you. You did not deserve it. You were a fugitive, he brought you 
He's brought you home. Secondly, the way we cultivate compassion is by praying for other people, praying for our neighbors, praying regularly for our coworkers, praying for our whole community, for Champaign-Urbana as a whole. The church is called to be a house of prayer for the nations. And thirdly, we have to be willing at some point to step out of what is comfortable to serve our neighbors, our community in Champaign-Urbana in some way. You might say, well, I'm not a speaker. I'm not an extrovert. Well, the good news is you don't have to be. You can serve people in so many different ways. If you can bake, if you can sew, you can quilt, you can shovel snow, you can encourage people. You can share lots of things with people all around you and do it in a safe way, even in the midst of our pandemic. So here's a very practical thing I want to ask us to do. Uh, maybe you have a piece, you know, something to write down with. Take a moment and think of maybe one or two people in our church or one, two, or three people, preferably three, not in our church in Champaign-Urbana. And as we are going through the season of Lent, I invite you to pray for them. And I would invite you to pick people that are not your buddies, you know, not your friends. People that maybe you don't know anybody. Maybe you just look through the participants here on the screen today and like, I don't know that person. I'll pray for him or I'll pray for her. I'll pray for that family. Somebody in our church. But also pray for, you know, find three people. Or think of three people. Could be your neighbors. Could be your doormates. Could be your classmates. Could be your professor. It could be anybody. But over the course of Lent, the season of Lent, which takes us, it starts on Wednesday and carries us all the way up to essentially Good Friday, you know, right before Easter but to pray regularly for them and then look for opportunities to be a blessing and serve. Where is God calling you to show mercy in Champaign-Urbana? I invite you to think about that. And uh, we'll talk more about it in weeks to come, but I, I really invite you to think of some practical ways you could be a part of God's merciful mission. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace this morning. And Lord, I recognize, um, you know, we're here on Valentine's Day, which is not the focus of this message. And that means a lot of things, a range of things to many people. But Lord, despite whatever that means and how we feel about it, I pray God that we would recall who we are in Christ, recipients of your amazing infinite mercy that we would recognize that you are sovereign over all of creation, all of life and all of us and our beloved city. And that you are inviting us to share your compassion for those around us. Lord, may we respond with willing hearts, with courage and with obedience in Jesus name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Brian, for opening the word for us today, for encouraging us, for challenging us. I wrote down the phrase, pass on compassion, and you gave us so many ways to think about that in different ways and, and to not only think about it, but respond and do things. So thank you so much for that. TCBC, it's our time to respond. How are you feeling about about the message today. Do you have any questions? If you have some questions or thoughts, feel free to respond by, by adding those to your connection card. You can, you see it, the link up there, tcbc.cc slash online card. Put in your thoughts. We would love to hear those. You can also respond by going to our prayer wall. Brian just challenged us to pray for one another, feel free to share those on our prayer wall um, and also put your own prayer requests in so that we can pray for you as well. That's another way to respond. We also invite you to respond through the giving of your tithes and offerings. You can bless our church and help us bless others and respond to needs in our community by giving and you can see the information there on the screen. At this time, as we're, we're heading to wrap up our service today, let's head back over to Andy. 
Amen. Thanks, Katie. Uh, thanks, Pastor Brian. Um, as we continue to respond, I um, want to invite us uh, to sing or even reflect on these words uh, from this song that we learned from South Africa. It's in English and in Zulu. receive the benediction that comes from Hebrews chapter 13 verses 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that 
that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you this week and hope to see you on Ash Wednesday. Now join me in singing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him.